Through my years of advising hundreds of startups, coaching executives, entrepreneurs, I have seen this one mistake that 99% of founders or individuals starting a business make right from the get-go. And in this video, I'm going to talk about it and what to do about it. Before we continue, my name is Ed Kang, seven-time funded founder with two exits, which pretty much means I failed multiple times, sometimes catastrophically. And that's what I like to do on this YouTube channel is talk about what I've gone through and hopefully share some wisdom and insights so others don't go through the same thing or at least have a better chance of success. I've been a founder, I've invested in startups, and I'm also looking as a general partner for a fund. So I look at startups all the time. So I get to talk to founders at all different stages, but I particularly enjoy working with founders right from the idea phase. My personal mission in life is to monetize vision. And my vision is that every executive and entrepreneur monetizes their vision, including me, to create more joy in the world. So welcome, and we're going to jump right in to the first mistake that I see. What is it? Well, it's thinking your first idea is a good one. I'm going to rip off the Band-Aid, and I'm just going to be straightforward and say, your first idea is never good. It isn't good. You should just be assuming that it isn't good. It might not necessarily be bad per se, but you should be questioning your first idea and asking yourself, how do I find out if this is a good idea? But unfortunately, which we'll talk about in a moment, there's something that we have called confirmation bias that just makes us automatically, well, I came up with the idea. Most likely there's a reason you came up with the idea. So it must be good and it must deserve investment and customers and it's going to be successful and all that stuff. Well, you should immediately be asking and questioning and going into inquiry mode on whether your first idea is a good one because the fact of the matter is, is typically the first idea isn't the one that you're going to end up with. It might be in the right direction, but investors invest in founders and not startups and ideas for that particular reason. They automatically expect that the founder is going to have to pivot and move to another idea or iterate on their current idea. So we want to see the founder have the resilience and the skill set to be have to have the self-awareness and to be aware enough or be savvy enough to say, okay, we need to change it. What we're going to talk about, how to fix this in three steps. And plus, if you stay to the end of the video, I'm going to give you my secret on how I make this decision because of the venture portfolio that I'm running and how I'm trying to ensure maximum success for every single idea that we do work on and we allocate investor resources to. This is the world of idea validation. And what happens is, I think many founders, entrepreneurs hear this word, if you've even heard it at all, or heard this term, idea validation. It's a crucial stage when it comes to the startup journey. Founders think, okay, my idea is already validated because I came up with it, because I've talked to some people who are in my sphere and they tell me it's a good idea, but I haven't really gone through the actual steps and a formal process for idea validation. Just because you think it's a good idea doesn't mean it's validated. And the more points you have of external validation, the better off you will be in making those iterative decisions, also known as the lean startup method, where you build, measure, learn. As, if you do as much idea validation, as soon as you step in the world of idea validation, the more you do, the more you stack the deck in your chances of being successful. So how's it done? Well, step one, start with a problem you have and want to fix yourself. This is where, generally speaking, the most common ideas come from founders saying, I have this problem. I want to fix it for myself. For example, I'm working on a startup right now that combines ChatGPT with different services, and it was all based upon my frustrations where I was experiencing friction in my role. And I began experimenting with ChatGPT. And I said, can ChatGPT solve my problem in the way that I occur or I do business in the marketplace? And I got some positive signals. So I started working with it. But 
I didn't immediately assume my idea was good. I went out to test it right away. And I said, can I just do some quick experiments? What have you? We'll talk about what an MVP is in a moment. Another idea that I have, which is getting quite a bit of traction in the marketplace, is I wanted to create a game. So my kids and I were playing, we, we play, you know, we went through a phase, we're playing poker, and then we went through a phase playing Magic the Gathering. And the two, playing the two, there was just something missing, it wasn't as satisfying. So I had this itch that I needed to scratch. So I said, can I come up with a game that combines Magic the Gathering and poker together? And so I began experimenting, created an MVP, tested it out with my kids, and now it's a full-blown game and could be turned into a video game and all this stuff. And there's licensing and like the business model is starting to roll. Well, that all started because I had a problem that I wanted to fix myself. There are many other stories of other ventures that I've done that have been funded, been successful, as well as founders that I've talked to and where they start, where they immerse themselves and they say, I have this problem. I want to fix it for myself. And then it becomes a startup. So that's step one. The next step is find out if enough people like you, which is the avatar, see the problem as you do, see the problem as you do. And this is going to require you to actually articulate the problem, create a proper problem statement, and you are the avatar. So what you're doing is, okay, so I'm Ed, here's my avatar, I am married, I'm a certain age, certain income, this and that, I like playing games, I like doing this, I'm, this is my job, etc. So I'm going to look out for other people like me, because if I don't, then there's too many options, all right? You you just, if you're looking at all the different demographics or you pick a demographic or a psychographic, firmographic, whatever graphic type of person or parameter for your ideal customer profile or the avatar that is outside of you, you can't relate to them. So I'm going to look for people like me, all right, who are in the same situation, et cetera, and, you know, my social circles, and they don't have to look like me, they don't have to be like me or come from the same geography, they have to have the same qualities and characteristics that make sense for me to approach them and say, do you see the problem the same way that I do? I write down the problem statement, and I pitch it to them, and I ask them, How's this occur for you? What do you think about the problem? What feedback would you give me? How could I reinforce this problem or iterate on this problem, make any adjustments for it to become more clear for you? And that's where I start. That's step two. Notice I haven't built anything yet, which is step three. Present your unique value proposition first, get feedback, then build your MVP. UVP is unique value proposition. So you've got your ideal avatar out there, you know the problem, and then you present your solution in a unique value proposition. So it may be, all right, let's go back to my gaming example. You like Magic the Gathering, but you don't want to spend all this money. This is what I did. You want to spend all this money in a play-to-win format where you're constantly buying packs and boosters and trying to collect, et cetera. And you like poker, but poker is just kind of serious and it's got money and it's the same thing. And you would like some type of fantasy element, everything like that. So my unique value proposition is I'm going to smash this game together and this is how the game is going to play that will scratch both the itches, be the perfect blend of the two worlds, all right? You can see this game actually for Magic the Gathering players who are old enough to go in a casino and play the game because it's a lot like poker. It's got the same dynamics as fast and you don't have to keep buying booster packs, et cetera, all right? So that's just general idea. Same thing with my chat idea, chat GBT. I'm going to find other people who are in the same situation who need a solution like I do and say, how about this? How about if we combine chat GBT with what you do as a coach, advisor, consultant, and what would that look like? And I get validation. I get feedback, which helps me validate or invalidate my idea. Both are really positive. Validate the idea while you follow the breadcrumbs. Invalidate, you're saying to yourself, hmm, actually, I didn't think about it that way. You're right. It might be a great idea for you because you're solving a problem, but it might not be a good enough idea and unique value proposition to it for it to become a full-blown startup. 
to invest your resources because you've got cost of opportunity. You could be doing other things, other people's money, employees, et cetera, could be the wrong way to go. And that's the reason idea validation can be so powerful. So that's what you want to do. Present your unique value proposition first, then build your MVP. MVP is minimum viable product. And it's what is the minimum amount of resource that I can invest to validate or invalidate that this little product actually delivers on the unique value proposition. All right. So that's the next step that you do. And your, your MVP doesn't, is not the full-blown software, but it doesn't have to be a light version of the software. It could be a different form to go there because it might be like a landing page or a demo video. I've seen so many different things. People build MVPs that actually don't do the thing, but demonstrate how the thing might work so that people give more feedback or there's pre-sales, they sign up for the launch, et cetera. Or for example, I'm building this one big software or I have a vision for this big software, but it's come out with this one chat GPT enabled function or this little app that does one thing and one thing alone compared to the 300 other things that I'm envisioning. Well, my MVP is the one thing because I've got enough feedback on my unique value proposition that I'm now going to test. How am I going to build this? And does it even work? Is it, am I even going in the right direction with what I'm building? And that's what an MVP is. So those are your three steps. Don't fall in love with your idea or your baby and believe your own press. That's advice that I got way back in the day when working, this is how old I am, uh, in the late 90s, working with .com 1.0, right? Web 1.0, it was that big bubble. And what I'm talking about is the confirmation bias. So there was a mentor and we were working on this startup it was music driven and music instruction online, everything like that, which is, you know, pretty big these days, but it was novel back then. And the founder got this advice from one of his advisors that said, don't fall in love with your baby, which is your idea and believe your own press. Confirmation bias is absolutely detrimental. It is a killer for founders. If you're not willing to step outside your own feelings about your own idea and your own self-esteem and go approach things like a scientist and have your confirmation bias challenged, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. I know founders, I've had co-founders, I've fallen into this trap that they just automatically think because it comes from them and everybody says you're special, right? You're a special generation and you can do anything you want, like become an astronaut or what have you. And a lot of times we get confirmation bias from the media when it comes to stars because telling anybody can become a founder. I saw a YouTube thumbnail the other day. Anybody can build a billion dollar business. That is simply not true if you're stuck in confirmation bias. There's no way you can build a billion dollar business if you're in confirmation bias because you're not going to be objective enough to make the critical decisions. If you're out of confirmation bias and you set everything up, can you build a billion dollar business? It's possible. Is it probable? Not really. A lot of things have to line up. But can you build a successful startup and have a successful career as an entrepreneur? 100% absolutely. But work on that confirmation bias. Don't fall in love with your baby. This includes founders that I've seen have a chance to exit or take investment. And they don't want to give away equity in the company because their baby's so precious. And then the startup folds. I've been part of companies that have been like that. Huge opportunity for an exit. The founders get offended. And it doesn't happen while well, it was pretty sad, the final result. Here, you made it to the end. This is my secret. I ask, can you monetize your vision, a world where the problem is solved, to create more joy for you and enough other people? What we call joy effects. This is an investment thesis that I operate under, and I'm pursuing it in my education as well as a doctoral thesis. Let's break this down. Can I monetize a vision? So will people pay for it? So that's what I want to find out. Will people pay? Will they, you know, part with their hard earned cash for it? And can I create the vision? Will they pay for a vision of the world where the problem is solved? Therefore, I'm clear on the problem. I'm clear on the solution, which is my, which is my unique value proposition. But if I execute and the problem is solved, then will that create more joy for me? I need to experience joy doing it. I don't want to work on startups. I become really picky. And 
thankfully I've got the luxury to do so. I'm very privileged that I don't want to work on startups that don't give me joy and don't bring joy with other people. If you can create joy for yourself, you're going to be motivated. If you get joy for other people. And what I mean by joy is that they're glad to be with you. You, They're glad you exist and your company exists and they want to be in a relationship with you in their strengths, but especially their weaknesses. Because as technology automates everything and we just take certain things for granted, such as access to phones and just hyper acceleration of information, people are going to need and want more joy in their lives. Technology needs to take a step back and they want to have relationships with people where they can experience strength and weakness, celebrate with each other. I want to be part of something big. I want to be part of a team and all those things. It's the reason I love watching Ted Lasso because of how they celebrate in their joy. But I love Ted Lasso because I feel connected to the show in my weakness. When (laughs) Ted Lasso talks about his parenting issues, his mommy and daddy issues, and going through all the relationship bumps and all the character arcs, they are transparent and they're vulnerable in their weaknesses. And I relate. So I love the show and winning all the Emmys that it's done. Then that gives you an idea of how great the show is and how connected they are. So a show like Ted Lasso creates joy while your startup can create joy as well. So can you monetize the vision? Can you make money in the world where the problem is solved and that world creates more joy for you and for other people? That's how I'm approaching it. And hopefully this has been helpful to you. Thanks so much for checking out the video. If you have any other thoughts or questions, please always appreciate your support. Leave a like or a comment, share the video. And if you're coming and watching this from startups.com, thank you so much. Happen to be the lead advisor there. So I'm able to work with all these other founders, glean these wonderful lessons and wisdoms and insights, and hopefully share with as many people as possible. Like I said, if you're from startups.com, checking out my total gratitude for your support. If you don't know about startups.com and you want an advisor like me, go check out startups.com and you'll see what we're doing as an online accelerator. Thanks again for checking out the video and I will see you in the next one.